this tonight, okay? Give me your best here in full attention. I believe this word is important. So, Lord, I thank you as we get into the word of the Lord tonight. And open heaven, your presence here. Holy Spirit, we thank you for coming to move in power. And even as I'm preaching tonight under a mighty anointing that the Holy Spirit move to every single person that's going to be listening or watching this in any way and help us to give you our best ear, our full attention, our focus to get locked in and in tune with you. Lord, as you speak through me, your word is living seed to truth, sown into good soil, watered by the Holy Spirit, take root, grow, and produce a hundredfold harvest of eternal fruit that remains till Jesus comes. Let the wind of your spirit blow this out among the nations. It'll get everywhere it's supposed to accomplish everything it's supposed to. And Lord, I thank you for everything said that needs to be said. And anything that's trying to hinder this word, we take authority as a church. We, any birds of the air that try to steal the seed, which is the enemy, we bind you in the name of Jesus. You will back off away from this word right now. It will get where it's supposed to and accomplish what it's supposed to because the Bible promises it will not return void, but go forth and accomplish what you sent it to do. We stand on that promise and we thank you, Lord, for it. We believe it. We expect it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So tonight I'm talking about a subject I enjoy talking about. I, I really don't have to have notes, but it's always good to have them. So let me just explain a couple things. If I was to ask you tonight, where is God the Father right now? He's in heaven, okay? He's on his throne, okay? And if I was to say, where is Jesus Christ right now? The right hand of the Father. And the Bible says he's always praying for us, okay? So he moved from his role when he walked the earth. It was kind of like a prophet, almost like Elijah with signs and wonders. He moved into more of a great high priestly role right now. Now, eventually, he's coming back as the king of kings. So he's going to come back as the son of David, as the king, to reign for a thousand years. But right now, he's at the right hand of the Father. So with that said, Jesus told us, it's better for you that I go away. How many knows that whenever he said that to the disciples, they probably thought, what, what now? Can you repeat that? Because they're probably thinking, no, I don't, for, I don't see how that would be possible. But it is because... The Holy Spirit is the one who lives inside of us. And not only that, but he can be at work in all of us, the entire body of Christ, at one time. Where Jesus was limited, if you will, to a physical location, the Holy Spirit isn't limited to one location. He can be, pouring, be poured out in an awesome way in America, and at the same time, he can be moving in signs and wonders in Africa. See what I'm saying? So Jesus said, it's better that I go away. I will send the comforter. And so the Holy Spirit, what I really want people to take away from this more than anything else tonight is he is a person. I want you to really get that because he is the one as a true believer. And if I was to ask you, what does it mean to be born again? Did you know there's people, I love the word of God so much. I love the word. But there's people that know the word and can quote the word. And they intellectually understand some things, but yet they don't really know God and they're not really born again. And you know what I'm saying? They're not saved. They're not going to heaven when they die. So the word of God, if you will, is not really the new birth. But who, what happens to us when we're born again? The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. And he makes you come alive. So the Holy Spirit indwells the true believer. And when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, how many knows he's loving and he's wonderful, but he's not going to let you get away with anything anymore, is he? Since you accepted Christ, how many of you have felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit? And I love the story about my wife because let me just explain this for a moment because she had, you got to understand, most of us have had some type of church background growing up. My wife grew up in a family that never went to church. So she had zero teaching or training. In fact, uh, it's sad, but her family actually taught her things that were wrong. And so she was actually taught wrong, that sin was okay, etc. And so when she accepted the Lord, it's interesting as we've talked and she shared with me her story because all of a sudden, 
she began to feel that certain things were wrong and she needed to stop doing them and she had no other reason to feel that way other than one thing and one thing only was now the Holy Spirit inside of her was telling her that's wrong because her family raised her to think it's okay she had zero church background she never read a Bible she had no knowledge of any but see the Holy Spirit will convict you and all of a sudden you won't be able to get away with things and let me give you a warning as a pastor. Do not ignore that because the Holy Spirit, you can harden your heart to the Holy Spirit. Be careful. If the Holy Spirit ever convicts you, yield to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and repent of it. Don't harden your heart to that. But the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that he will be with you, he will be in us, and he will teach us. If somebody says, well, I have a hard time understanding the Bible, I understand that especially if you're trying to go back and read maybe an older version like the King James and 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 you're looking through the word and there's so much in here and I can understand where a new believer wouldn't understand everything but you know who actually wrote the Bible I know that people say well there were so many different authors over so many different years that's true but the Bible was written actually by the Holy Spirit who moved through men and made sure that everything came forth that was the will of God. And it is amazing, anybody that actually knows the Bible, it is amazing that all these different authors over so many hundreds and thousands of years could actually write something that flows together perfectly and makes perfect sense. In fact, the Bible is the only book that history is written in advance with 100% accuracy. So everything the Bible has ever predicted is except for things that are to come, I know, but everything that it has predicted up to this point has happened just like it said it would. So the Bible is the inspired word of God. Now there's been an attack against the Bible now for the last couple of decades. So let me get this in this series on keys to an effective prayer life. And maybe this is the only series, maybe even the only sermon you've heard me preach Listen, God did not have a problem writing the Bible. The Holy Spirit knew exactly what he was doing when he wrote the Bible through people. The Bible is the perfect word of God. And if, if you don't understand it or you've heard that it's got errors and different things like that, it does not. It's the perfect word of God. There's not, it's without fault. It is the word of God. But Satan has been trying to attack this word for years and wants to discredit it. You know how lost we would be without the Bible? We know from reading the book of Judges that everybody would just do what's right in their own eyes. People would start making up their own rules. This is right for me and, right this, and other things right for you. People would be totally lost. People would have nothing to anchor them in truth if we lost this word. And so we need the word of God, but the Holy Spirit is the one who wrote it. So I say that to say this. If you need to understand this Bible, be patient as the Holy Spirit teaches you, but ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand it. Because as I ask the Holy Spirit, God has helped me so much to understand the Word of God. And it is the Word of God is amazing and we need it, but we also must have both the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Because I've seen where some people just focus on the Word of God and they don't really want much of anything to do with the move of the Holy Spirit, with tongues, the gifts, the power of God. They don't want much of anything to do with the Holy Spirit. They just want the word alone. But yet many times they get prideful, they get critical, they get very religious and stale and dry in their relationship with the Lord. There's no power. Listen, we need the word of God for sure, but we also need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And when I pray... I mean, from beginning to end in my prayer life is so many different scriptures. I mean, even my prayer life itself, as I've been teaching this series, those that's been following it, is based on the Lord's Prayer. And all these different things that I pray, whether it be you're worshiping and hallowing the name of God and all the different things that I'm praying, is scripture. So I love the Word of God. But you must have not only the Word, you've got to have the Holy Spirit. And so as I pray and I'm quoting scriptures and I'm meditating on the word, my mind's being renewed, 
There's another part of my prayer life that brings everything to life and causes my prayer life to be so powerful, and that is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And I've always got this mindset. I know the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, but I want his fellowship. And I'm asking, I say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, let me have your fellowship today that you come with wisdom and revelation, your counsel, your might, your knowledge, the fear of the Lord, that you come and, and that I might have fellowship. And it just so happened this week, because I mean, as the Lord doesn't speak to you all the time, but this particular week I was praying, and I told my wife about this, I'm not going to share what it was, but as I was praying, the Holy Spirit just stopped me. And he said to me, just like a conversation, it was amazing. He said to me, you have been thinking this way about certain, a certain thing, but he said you haven't really understood it. It's actually this way. And when he said that to me, I saw something I'd never seen before in a way I've never seen it before. And I thought that is going to be so helpful in my prayer life because now it redirected me to be able to pray in a more effective way. And so the Holy Spirit will do that. He will teach us. And I think about all the times, thank God, we didn't know what to do sometimes. And my wife and I would be praying specifically about a situation in the family. And the Holy Spirit, uh, over a course of years, kept speaking to us things. I mean, real specific words. And we would just hear it and obey it. And then God eventually worked it out just like he said he would exactly that way. But we had to hear from the Holy Spirit. How many knows there's many times where you're in a situation in life, do I take this job or do I take, do I move to this area? Do I need to go to this church? Do I need, is this person somebody that would be, I need to have in my life? Or do I need the kids to do this with their education? Do, and there's a lot of things in life where you're not going to be able to just go like this and know exactly what to do this this is the source of truth but we've got to learn to be led by the holy spirit because he's the one that will give us that guidance that we need okay there's going to be a lot of things in life where you need that relationship with the holy spirit to speak to you or direct you and the holy spirit he may not always speak to you like a conversation this week, I thank God for him speaking to me in that way, but most of the time, he hasn't. How does the Holy Spirit speak to you most of the time? If you can look this way and listen to me, this is probably one of the more important things I'm saying tonight, so don't miss it. Most of the time, the Holy Spirit is not going to speak to you like a sentence. He might, but a lot of times, it's what is called the umpire of the heart. How many have ever watched baseball enough to know that there's an umpire behind the catcher that's saying it's a strike or it's a ball? And then, you know, he's got to direct that, right? He's got to be the one to call it. So whenever you're living in life and you need direction, the Holy Spirit is the one in you that will give you a peace about a certain direction or he will give you a check in the spirit that that's not right. That's usually the way the Holy Spirit will direct you. Have you ever had that feeling that something just isn't quite right here? That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit may give you a dream. He may give you a vision. He may speak to you directly. Many times he'll use his word to speak to you. Maybe some specific thing in the Bible that pertains to your situation. That's where the Bible moves from being a logos word to a rhema word. I remember one time, I'll give you an example of, of that. I was in a situation where in my life, things had been a certain way, but it seemed like it was time for change, but I didn't really know what was going on. And this was probably 2003, and I was talking back then with Brother Holt, but you guys have met him. And he told me, he said, like the prophet Elijah, you had been over there by the brook Cherub, and God's been feeding you and giving you water and taking care of you but he said it's drying up it because it's time for change and it's something else is about to come to pass and open up for you and it did just like he said but see how a story in the bible about elijah by the brook cherub went from just being a logos word that was written back then to applying to my life at that exact moment and it became a rhema word for me and so 
God will speak to you also through other people, like I just mentioned with this pastor that God used to speak into my life. But let me give you some scriptures tonight because I really want people to take away the importance of listening to the Holy Spirit and being led by him. There's going to be a lot of times in life and the days to come, I think we're right in the middle of it, where there's going to be potentially confusion and deception. And we're not just going to need the word alone. We're going to need to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. All right, let me give you some scriptures. Jesus said, I've spoken these things to you while I'm still with you, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. What is the Holy Spirit going to teach us? He's going to teach us everything we need to know. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And I thank God that he's praying for us. But the Holy Spirit is the one who is with us right now teaching us. And I want you to see how the early church took this so literal. Please listen to what I'm saying right here. This, this scripture, I love this scripture because the early church, this was the apostles. And they, they were the ones that Jesus told them this. He said, I'm going away, but I'm going to send to you the Holy Spirit and he will teach you he will give you direction they took that literal like you and i should but listen to this in acts 15 28 when all of a sudden god began to move among the gentiles and all these gentiles started getting saved and the early church was jewish and they were asking god what do we do how do we handle this situation and they needed direction they knew from the word of God because they were quoting it. They were talking about, remember, uh, things like David's tent being restored and all this, and they knew that the gospel would go to the Gentiles. So they knew the word of God, but they needed direction in this, in this specific situation. And it says in Acts 15, 28, that this group of elders and leaders were meeting in Jerusalem. And listen to what they said. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to put on you no greater burden than these necessary things. I want you to notice this. That the early church consulted the Holy Spirit. The leadership of the church, the leadership that was in Jerusalem. I'm talking about this would have been Peter. This would have been James, the brother of Jesus, etc. The highest order of leadership that was in Jerusalem consulted the Holy Spirit and they said it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us that we're only going to give you these things and it says in verse 29 to the Gentiles to abstain from food offered to idols from sexual immorality which is any sex outside of marriage between a husband and wife and from strangled animals and blood talking about don't eat blood and so he said, if you, or the early church said, if you keep yourselves from these things, you'll do well. But I want you to notice that they depended on the Holy Spirit to guide them. Is everybody seeing that? What would it be like today if the leadership of churches and groups of people, whether it be denominations or fellowships, whatever, if they would gather together and they would have prayer meetings instead of just business meetings and they would ask the holy spirit and wait on him to speak to them and give them direction about what to do i wonder how different some things would be are y'all hearing me tonight and then romans 8 14 it says for as many are, that are led by the spirit of god these are the sons of god sonship implies maturity so you move from being a little child into a son that there's a there's a growing up involved in that and so he's saying here those that have learned to be led by the holy spirit you've matured and see this is important for us that we learn that we learn the leading of the holy spirit uh, some of you it's interesting as i minister through the years i've had many times that are kind of it can be kind of funny as I remember praying sometimes for young people and they've never felt the Lord before in their life. And they'll get up off the floor and they'll be looking at their arms or something and the presence of God is so strong on them that they're having a hard time even moving. And they say, what is this? 
What am I feeling right now? So that's the Holy Spirit. And I remember one time, it's a story I've told many times to you guys, but there was a guy named Vern that was fixing my AC back in the 90s. And I was talking to him, and he was really stubborn and didn't want to accept Christ as his Savior. In this, he had worked with a, a preacher that witnessed to him all the time. And, but while I was talking to him, the Holy Spirit fell on him, and he began to shake and cry. And he said to me, what is this that I'm feeling? I said, that's the Holy Spirit on you. I said, the Lord is trying to save you, Vern. And he, and he broke down crying and accepted the Lord. What made the difference was the Holy Spirit. Listen, we need to understand that. And I think many times that people, they sense something in the air. They feel something. They may describe the glory as it feels heavy. Or they may feel the power of God and they say it feels like electricity or something. And they don't really know how to describe what they're feeling but they're feeling the presence and power of the holy spirit and we need to get accustomed to the holy spirit one of the things that they teach supposedly in the banking system is they focus on the real so that they can spot a counterfeit they don't focus on the counterfeit so we need to get so accustomed to the holy spirit his presence his power his leading his voice that whenever something that's not of God shows up, we instantly recognize it. And I love this scripture, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the, the communion or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Did everybody see that? That's how Paul closed his last writing that we know of to the church in Corinth. He said the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and what? the fellowship or the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. I looked up the word communion there or fellowship, and it's the word koinonia, which means intimate fellowship. It implies if I was to sit, and sit down at a table at Brahms, eating my ice cream, hanging out here with Alexa, we're both eating our ice cream, and we're talking about your day, okay? It implies a relationship that you're speaking together. The Holy Spirit speaking to you, you're speaking to him. Paul was saying that you might know the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That he can lead you and speak to you. Now I think about the tabernacle. I've shared this so many times, I'm not going to dwell on it. But in the tabernacle, the menorah represents the God's family tree. And to us as his family, in his family tree, we've been engrafted into Christ, who's that center branch, but the different knops and buds and bowls that were shaped and fashioned into that uh, lampstand, there was 66 of them if you count all of them. And we have a 66 book of the Bible today that is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. So God's given us his family. He's given us as his family his word. And that came to Israel originally on what is called Pentecost back then, Shavuot at Sinai. God gave his word on that day. Then... All those years later, 1,500 years later or so, on the same feast of Pentecost, God gave us his family tree, what? His Holy Spirit. And that's why the menorah has seven branches. It speaks of the Holy Spirit, who's, number one, the Spirit of the Lord, but he's also the Spirit of wisdom and revelation, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. So when he comes in his fullness... The Holy Spirit comes in all seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit, okay? And that's what the Bible's talking about when it talks about the sevenfold Spirit of God. In Revelation 1, verse 4, it says, Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne of God. So there's not seven Holy Spirits, but what that's saying here is Isaiah 11, 2. This is why it's important to know the Bible. Because the Bible interprets the Bible. In uh, Isaiah 11, 2, we get this. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, counsel about knowledge, the fear of the Lord. And it says about Jesus, he shall delight in the fear of the Lord. It's interesting because every once in a while when you're preaching, you sense that you're coming up against something. And I feel that there is a religious spirit in the region where I'm planted that does not want me preaching about the Holy Ghost. I sense it here tonight. It's not you. 
It's something territorial. See, the church was born in the fires of revival. Think about this. How really truly was the church birthed on the day of Pentecost? Jesus told them, he breathed on them. I believe the Holy Spirit entered them, but he said, I want you to go wait in Jerusalem till you're clothed with power. Then you'll be my witnesses. So they went and tarried there and prayed. The Holy Spirit, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues. But listen, we need the move of the Holy Spirit. That's really when Moses said to God, God said, I'm going to lead you out of this place into the land of Canaan. Moses said, please do not lead us out of this place unless your presence goes with us. He said, if we do not have your presence with us, we are no different than any other nation. What will differentiate us from anybody else other than the presence of God in our midst? And I believe that's why so many in the day that we've been living in the last couple of decades, y'all please hear what I'm saying. The Bible predicted there would be a great falling away. We're seeing people fall away from the faith. We're seeing people that grew up in church get away from God. And, and I know many don't, but there's also some that do. And I think sometimes the reason why people get so disillusioned with God in the church is because they're never experiencing anything real. What would it be like if people saw with their own eyes miracles happening? What would it be like if they themselves feel the power of God and they're baptized in the Holy Spirit? They're speaking in tongues. What do you see the difference if they experience God's presence, if they see the power of God, that produces faith in people. And that causes people to draw close to God and see the reality of the Bible because this book is not a history book alone. This book is living. The Bible says that the word of God is alive and active. The reason why it's living is because it is real and active today. The same God that healed Back in Moses' day, the same God that healed through the days of Elijah, the same God that healed in Jesus' ministry and healed people in the early church and has healed people down through the last 2,000 years is the same God that will heal people in this room tonight. The same thing I could say about any other aspect of Christianity today, the same God that delivered people under Jesus' ministry, drove out demons under Philip's ministry in Samaria, is the same one that will deliver people today. The same God that baptized people in the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost will baptize you in the Holy Ghost right now. How many over since this last Pentecost conference, how many were baptized in the Holy Ghost, spoke in tongues? There's some here today. How many people came to River of Life and then got baptized in the Holy Ghost and spoke in other tongues? Is that waving at me? So he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't get distracted. God help us with these heretics that are cessationists that think that they know this a lot more than what they obviously do. God is still active today. Now, let me tell you the importance of the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Acts 4, 27. Indeed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were assembled against your holy son, Jesus, whom you have anointed to do what your hand and your counsel have foreordained would be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats because they were the Sanhedrin were threatening the early church. Don't continue to preach in the name of Jesus. Remember that? They had Peter and John beaten, and they warned them. And they met together, and they were in a prayer meeting. And in that prayer meeting, they were crying out to God. They said, now, Lord, look at their threats. They're telling us we can't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And what did they ask for? They said, Lord, grant us that we may speak your word with boldness. How many knows we need a boldness? By stretching out your hand to heal that signs and wonders may be performed in the name of your holy son, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. That's what we need right there. The baptism and the Holy Spirit, I'll talk more about it in a moment, 
But one of the aspects of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is God will fill you with a boldness that you're no longer cowardly and weak and timid. Now you can be bold for God and be strong in him. You know, Smith Wigglesworth was very bold. I mean, he's the guy that raised the dead a couple times, picked up one dead guy, kept punching him in the stomach, live. Now listen, the guy was dead, okay? So it didn't hurt. This live, punched him in the gut, and the guy came back to life. But I remember that Smith Wigglesworth was actually an uneducated, timid, shy plumber. I don't think he could read. Does anybody remember that story? I think he had a hard time where he actually was uneducated, didn't really know how to read very well. But he heard about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so he went to this group where they were in a house and they were praying. And there was like a, if I remember the story right, I've read it, but it's been a long time ago. There was a, one of those old uh, wood stoves. And he knelt down. It was cold. And there was a guy there praying with him. And he was, his attitude was such, I'm not leaving until I get baptized in the Holy Ghost. And the guy prayed with him until he was filled and baptized with the Holy Ghost and spoke in spoken tongues. He comes out of that time goes back his wife had up to that point had really been the one that was really a fiery witness for the lord he was a shy plumber and they were involved in the salvation army which way back then was totally different than it is now back then it was actually a group of people that would dress up in uniforms and they would play music and march through the streets to get everybody's attention and then they would get up on some kind of pedestal and they would preach fiery holy ghost messages and see a great harvest of souls it was born in the fires of revival william booth is the one that wrote the song we sing send the fire in that song we need another pentecost and all of a sudden, they had, Smith Wigglesworth at some point had been asked to get up and share whatever, and he began to preach with such fire and boldness that his wife's in the audience, her mouth hung open, that is not the guy I married. Who left the other day as a shy plumber who would never get up in front of anybody. Look at him go now. He's up there preaching with fire. And not only that, but he learned to read the Bible, or he learned to read by reading the Bible. And his attitude was, I don't want anything in my house to read but the Bible. So he didn't want the newspaper, which is fine. And he took communion every day. Not only that, but Smith Wigglesworth saw tremendous healings and miracles like you wouldn't believe. What happened to him? What really made the difference? It was just simply the baptism in the Holy Ghost that made the difference. He got a boldness about him. And listen, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is when you begin to enter the supernatural aspect of Christianity. I look at Christianity like this, like the tabernacle of Moses. The outer court is natural sunlight, and, it, and it's just where the blood and water is. That's where a lot of people get saved and they hang out in the outer court. But when you move past that first veil and you go inside the tent, that's like the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Because now you begin to move into dimensions that were never available to you before. And that realm was lit up by the menorah, which represents revelation knowledge. You begin to move into a deeper place. Listen, we need to get out of the natural sunlight into a place where God is giving us revelation knowledge and the power of God. Listen, when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, when I've prayed for some of you in this room and you felt the power of God, how many knows that that was not me? What was that? That is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's the power of God touching you. You need that for you, but also the Bible says in Mark 16, you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Now, this is the words of Jesus. He said, these signs will follow them that believe in my name. They will speak in new tongues. That's speaking in tongues. That we would cast out demons. We'd lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. That's for you. What you and I need is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We need a boldness to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
When Peter had to stand, they'd, they'd prayed for the cripple that got healed. They had to stand before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was threatening them. You are to no longer speak in this name. The Bible says Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to say back to them, this is the group of the leadership that had Jesus crucified. These were the, the, the people that had authority. Peter was filled with boldness. And he said to them, you judge for yourself if it's right for us to obey you rather than God. But he had a boldness. You began to move into revelation. You began to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Not only tongues, but you can begin to operate in gifts of faith where you have supernatural faith that's beyond you. The gift of healing where you lay hands and you pray for the sick or you have words of knowledge that bring healing. You can begin to operate in the gifts of working of miracles where, for example, like when, uh, you know, Brother Rocky, he operates real powerful on that and he prays and, and the leg grew out or straightened and all that where there's things that happen right there. That's the working of miracles. You can begin to operate in tongues and interpretation and prophecy. You, be, you can begin to get revelation through words of wisdom, words of knowledge and discerning of spirits. How many knows we need revelation knowledge, including the discerning of spirits, which I think is probably the least respected gift of the spirit in operation in the church today. Probably in these last days, one of the more important gifts that we're going to need. But all of this comes when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit because it's no longer just the Holy Spirit living in you. Y'all look this way and hear me. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you. But when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, now the Holy Spirit clothes you with power from on high. Well, it's no longer just him living in you. Now he comes upon you in power. And he will fill you with a boldness. And as I said earlier in my sermon, we need the word of God so much. It's perfect and infallible. It's our source of truth. We test everything by the word. If you want to know what truth is, you better judge everything by the word of God. And the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches us the word. To not be deceived, we need to know this word. But I believe, River of Life, this is not just for us. This is for many others. And I want everybody to please hear me. This is a good feeling. I've wondered... Uh, when I started preaching, I was like, what am I feeling in the area? It's not you. It's not here in this church. But what am I feeling in this area? The devil does not want the churches to get back to the power of, the, the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. In this day that we're living, it's become common that if the Holy Spirit even starts moving a teeny bit, they rush it off to a back room like they're ashamed of it. I don't think that uh, the early church in the upper room was trying to rush it off to a back room somewhere. We don't want to offend anybody. That's a joke, friend. Listen, tongues is a sign to the unbeliever. The Bible says those words. It is a sign to the unbeliever. What happened on the day of Pentecost? 3,000 people got saved. So what happens? So look, the power of God, we don't need to be ashamed of it. I think in some places, if you took all the power that they got, somehow together, like dynamite, got it all together, packed together, and it exploded at one time, it wouldn't be enough to blow their nose real good. But we need to have a powerful move of God that's exploding in our midst, producing healing and deliverance. Because people are need how many knows that people have serious needs that come to church? And what they don't need is just another program with steps to go through that at the end of the day is just putting a band-aid on it. They need the power of God to go into that area of their life, whatever that is, deliver them, heal them, set them free. So God is preparing us, River of Life. For a depth, and not just us, many other people, I believe, a depth of his presence and an intensity of his power greater than past moves of God. I believe God has been getting us ready for something of great significance that's right in front of, not only River of Life, I think it's something that's in front of the church. I believe that God is about to send another global move of God that's going to usher in the coming of Christ. 
this global move is going to be so intense. I'm going to give you a few scriptures. In Luke 5, 17, it says, On a certain day as Jesus was preaching, the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting nearby. How many knows they always try to show up? They had come from every town in, in Galilee, in Judea, and from Jerusalem. But look at what it says. And the power of the Lord was present to heal the sick. We need the power of God present to heal. This is the same story. How many knows you got true friends when they're going to rip a roof open and lower you down in there, right? You need friends like that. And they got their paralytic friend up there. They lowered him down on a cot. Here Jesus is preaching in a house. And all of a sudden, I can just imagine the dust is coming down, you know. Next thing you know, as Jesus is trying to preach, and he's already dealing with these annoying Pharisees over here, probably, or I just see him arms folded, you know, glaring at him. And, and Jesus having to deal with these annoying people. And next thing you know, here comes this guy lowered down like this, you know, in front of him. And there he is. But the Bible says the power of God was present to heal. And that man walked out of there that day. He had to be carried up on the roof and lowered down, but he walked out. In Mark 5, 25, there was a certain woman that had a hemorrhage for 12 years. She was bleeding like a menstrual thing, but it was continual. And she had suffered much under, the, under many physicians. She had spent all she had, and not better, but grew worse. And when she had heard Jesus, she came in the crowd behind him, and she touched his garment. For she said, if I may just touch his garments, I may be healed. So here's something if you read all of the Gospels. Jesus was going places. And whenever he obviously wore a tallit, which would have been in those days more like a tunic. And everywhere that Jesus was going, if you read like the book of Mark and all that, there would have been some kind of uh, stories like this. All those that were touching the corner of his garment where his tassel, the tzitzit was, all that were touching that were being healed. Healing virtue flowed into them. She probably heard stories about it. But not only that, it's in line with uh, the scriptures. In Malachi, he will rise with healing in his wings. But she got on the ground, I'm sure, and she crawled up to him and she reached up and grabbed that corner of his garment called the kanaf where that tassel, the tzitzi, but she grabbed that, and when she did, healing shot through her body. Jesus did not pray for her. Did you, did you ever read that story and really realize? Jesus did not pray for her. He didn't call her out of the crowd. He wasn't even paying attention to her. It was literally her faith that made her whole. She said, if I can just get to Jesus, and I can just grab his garment, I know I'll be healed. And man, when she did, she was. And Jesus felt healing shoot out of him. He's around a whole crowd of people. He starts asking his disciples, who touched me? And I can just imagine, they're like, Lord, who hasn't touched you? We're in a crowd. Everybody's, no, he said, no, no. Somebody got healed. And he's looking around, he sees that woman, and she's probably feeling like, am I about to get in trouble? You know, was I supposed to touch him? Because under Jewish law, she was considered unclean. And she She's still touched. Anyway, and Jesus said, woman, your faith has made you whole. Go home in peace, you know. But listen, it's the power of God. Jesus walked in that power. We need that power in our churches today, amen, that people can come in and be healed, can be delivered. And I'm pressing in for more of that than we've ever had. The Lord spoke to me many years ago, and I close with this. I remember just meditating on the story of Joseph in the coat of many colors. And, and I was thinking about how God gives us mantles. Because I, I don't remember at what point in time. But I know early on in my salvation, I was at a meeting. And there was a time that God prayed for me. And it was a mantling. And it was really a powerful life-altering thing for me. And so I'm sure I was thinking. It's been so many years. I think I was thinking about that. And all, but the Lord spoke to me. And this is what he told me. He said, you know, a mantle is a mantle of many anointings. And I never forgot that because what he was saying to me was, was don't just get in one single move of the Holy Spirit among one group. And that's all you ever get. 
It was as though the Lord was saying, there's many different moves of my spirit out there, and you need to get there and let that come into your life as well. And so I have. I've, I've been to many different places where God has been moving in an awesome way, and it would be very different than other moves of God. But just take that because the Lord told me that, and I think that may minister to somebody that's hearing this. God wants our mantle to be saturated with a lot of different anointings. I think about King David. He was anointed by Samuel, but later anointed in Hebron, then it later anointed in Jerusalem. Different anointings on his mantle. And then the glory fire of God's presence. That glory is the weightiness. How many have ever felt the weightiness of God? I remember one time I was going through praying for people, and the power of God was touching them. And, this, and I remember this one lady, and we had all moved on. We were doing something else. And I noticed in the corner of my eyes, she was still out under the power of whatever. So a long time later, she came up to me and she said, I don't know what just happened. This is what she said. I don't know if a fat angel sat on me or what. I said her exact words. But she said, I couldn't get up if my life depended on it. And I felt that before, that original time when that man prayed for me, and I was talking about that mantling. I went out under the power, but there was this weightiness of the presence, the glory. See, the word for glory is chavod, and it means like a weightiness. And I was under that weight, and I'm not so sure if somebody didn't yell fire and pull the fire alarm if I could have got up. I was just under the weight of God's glory, and I was out for a long time. I mean, like an hour, but it didn't seem like a long time. But she finally got up and said, Pastor, I don't know what happened, if there's a fat angel set on me or what, but I couldn't get up. And I was like, well, it wasn't a fat angel. I said, it was the glory on you, that weight of the glory, amen. And then another thing, the raw power of God. I think that that's what shot out of Jesus and healed the woman was the power. So the glory implies like a weightiness. How many have felt a heavy presence of the Lord? You felt like a weight. That's the glory. But also, another word for the glory is Shekinah, and it, it's the visible, like we see fire or something. But now let's go to the power of God. What is the power of God? It's the word dunamis, and it's where we, we get the word dynamite. But the power of God is explosive. And people that have described the power of God, it might be kind of like an electric, but it's just power. I mean, it's just God's power. And when his power comes in, it heals. It delivers. And Dr. Cho tells a story, listening to him tell it, you're going to just laugh. I mean, he was this demon-possessed person. He was, first time he'd ever had it happen, he's scared. Him telling it was hilarious. But he said at some point in time, as he's kind of running in his office from a demon-possessed person, he said that all of a sudden he felt this power of God come on him, and the demon-possessed person just kind of froze like, uh oh and he said the power of god came on him so strong and then he pointed at it and the demon left but see that's the thing it's not by our human effort it's the power of god you know dr cho used to also tell that story you've probably heard me say where his mother-in-law would go out and witness and people would cry and get saved and he would go witness and they'd get mad at him and they want to beat him up or throw rocks at him and he got he got frustrated he's like why is it you go out and witness. People cry. I go out and witness. People want to beat me up. And she said, you need the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so he said, I went out in the woods. I hugged a tree. I prayed. I said, Lord, I'm not leaving this tree until I get baptized in the Holy Spirit. He did get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Came back. Everything was different. What made the difference? Jesus said in Acts 1.8, when you receive the Holy Spirit, he comes upon you in power. Then you will be what? My witnesses. To be an effective witness, you need the Holy Spirit moving upon people. And what is it that brings healing to people? It's not you and I. We can pray for the sick, but it's not really us. We use our authority and everything. We pray all, but really, truthfully, at the end of the day, it is the power of the Holy Spirit that heals that person. And same thing with demons. We need to use our authority. I've seen many, many demons flee from people, come out of people, a lot of deliverances. But I assure you, I stand there in authority and I take authority and I'm using my authority. But at the same time, I know it's the power of God that's actually going to get this thing done. 
And finally, it's the bride made ready. The Holy Spirit is the one that sanctifies us. The Holy Spirit is the one that fills us with extra oil. If we want to be ready for the coming rapture, he's coming for wise virgins with extra oil. That's those that are filled up with the extra oil of the Holy Spirit. What is the oil of the Holy Spirit? That is the move of God in your life. That is the Holy Spirit. I love the word. But that is not really coming from just reading the word of God. That is coming from having a relationship and being in the presence of the Holy Spirit, spending time with the Lord. Listen, we need the word, but we also must have the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. And, and I believe that's what's missing in many churches today. They, they may teach the word, and that's wonderful because we really need that. I'm not taking away from that. But if they would preach the word of God under the anointing, then the Holy Spirit would be moving and people would not be able to come week in and week out and live in unrepentant sin because the Holy Spirit would convict them of that sin. And they would either come down and get saved or repent or whatever, or they would leave. But either way, the Holy Spirit would not allow it to remain. Do you hear what I'm saying? Listen, I'm all about sinners coming in here to get saved. But if somebody's been coming for two years and they're living in unrepentant sin and they can sit through your church services with no problems, they're not convicted, there's something wrong with your church. How many knows I'm telling the truth? I remember Steve Hill, he was telling me, and he was kind of mad when he was talking about it. There was a young couple that, had been, that came and they got convicted. He preached, I think, one service and Brother Steve had that on him, man. He had that anointing. But he preached, and, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is moving. People are coming down to get saved. And this couple comes down to get saved. And you know what they told him? They said, before we came here, we were going to another church for a year. They were living together outside of marriage for a year in sin. If they died in a car wreck or something, they would have gone straight to hell. But in one service with Steve Hill, the conviction of the Holy Spirit came. They came down and got saved. They repented and got their life right with God. I believe they got married or whatever. But they knew by the Holy Spirit what they were doing was wrong. If people can come for a year to your church, and I, I'm not going to back off from this. If they can come for a year and never be convicted of their sin, there is something seriously wrong with your church. And I would say, is it really a church or is it just a social club? Because the Holy Spirit is not going to let us get away with things. And that, listen, I, the Bible says about Jesus, he delights in the fear of the Lord. I want that in my life. I want the fear of God where the Holy Spirit isn't going to let me get away with anything. How many love the Holy Spirit? You're thankful for him. And you want him to convict you. Lord, if there's something not right, show me. Convict me. Don't leave me like I am. And certainly don't leave me to my own devices. Just like parents, any, any good parents with a brain in their head knows you don't just leave your kids to their own devices. You have to raise them. How many knows what I'm talking about? You got to help when they're younger make decisions for them because if you just let them just do whatever, do you think they're always going to make a smart decision? There's probably going to be a lot of dumb decisions. And so you're going to have to come in and go, no, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to have that. No, we're not going to watch that. In the same exact way, the Holy Spirit is at work in you and me, no matter what age we are physically, he's at work in us saying, no, we're not going to watch that anymore. No, we're not going to have that in our home anymore. You're not going to keep doing that. And you know that you used to get mad and say that right there? You're not saying that anymore. <laughs> How many knows the Holy Spirit is not going to let you get away with stuff? He's come to convict us of sin and change us, amen? amen? To be like Jesus. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God that he would not let us get away with things. I want him to convict me. So, Lord, we thank you tonight. Let's just take a moment. Lord, we thank you tonight for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're a person, and we want to say thank you, Holy Spirit, for living in us and not giving up on us, Holy Spirit, because all of us have failed you many, many times and have probably grieved you many times, but Holy Spirit, you've never just abandoned us. You've never left us as an orphan. You have stayed with us. You've convicted us. You've helped us. 
And we thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for teaching us the Bible, leading us into all truth. And Holy Spirit, we want to get to know you better than we have. And that's what I want to pray tonight for everyone here, that God make us more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. How many really sincerely want that? That when you leave out of here, you're more sensitive to the Holy Spirit than you've ever been in your life. And you're more discerning than you've ever been. We're going to need that. I didn't say that in this sermon. I want to make sure that I say that before we close this out. We're going to need true discernment in these last days. Make sure that you pray about that. We need the Holy Spirit to show us what's of him and what's not because there's going to be a lot of deception and there's going to be a lot of counterfeit stuff. And we need the Holy Spirit. Amen? All right. We're going to go ahead and move now to the altar.